Okay, um, I'm Rachel Nainans. Um, I'm doing an assignment in study of religion for school um, on the topic, to what extent do particular Christian communities in the South Burnet encourage their members to live an ethical life? Mm -hmm. um, so I chose to do you guys and yeah. Okay, so what's the sort of rough estimation of how many people are in this sort of community sort of thing, like worldwide? In terms of who are listening to Divine Truth? Yeah. Um, well, we don't really know because we've given away 150,000 DVDs or so and we've, uh, we've got 700 hours of material on YouTube and there's been 260,000 views or 250,000 views of that material on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So we don't really know how many people are actually listening to the material that we present. But uh, there are probably 40 or 50 families locally who regularly listen to the presentations we present locally. Yeah. Because we don't have a membership or we don't keep a track of people in any way or how, what they do with the material that we present, it's really hard for us to gauge. Yeah. Sometimes when we go to a new place uh, somewhere we haven't been before around the world, we suddenly meet all these people who've been listening to us on YouTube or reading what's on the internet, but they've never contacted us before. Mm. They're just interested in the teachings. So. Do you ever get some um, sort of insulting comments or anything said to you when you're just walking around town or anything? Or? No, it's very, it's very rare. We, we often get uh, angry people feeling anger towards us, but it's very rare for them to express it. Um, mm. Most people are, in Australia are fairly polite and, yeah. and, uh, and reserved when it comes to expressing their rage in public, I suppose. So, but, but the reality is we do feel when people are disapproving, but, uh, but very few people have ever expressed that to us yeah. in a, in, when we we're publicly walking the streets in Kingaroy or anything like that. Yeah. People tend to do it by email because it's less scary for them, maybe. Yeah. Really, do you get a lot of um, social sort of obscene emails? We get uh, a combination of obscene emails, usually directed at Mary, uh, or insulting emails, usually directed at myself. Um, the insulting ones are mostly from Christian religionists, and the abusive ones towards Mary are mostly from men who are being sexual, sexualised in their, in, in nature. So, yeah, we get all sorts of different sort of attacks, but, but it's lessening as things progress. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we get lots of emails from other people who are very nice and just yeah. interested. Yeah. How do you think um, this sort of religion, if you could call it that, um, how do you think it differs from other religions in the world and um, Christianity? Well, firstly, I wouldn't say it's a religion. Um, it's a way of life. It's, it's the way you live your personal life. So it's got nothing to do with how anybody else who you know lives their life. It's got everything to do with just you living your life in harmony with desires, but also in harmony with love. And so in that regard, we're focused primarily on helping people understand love and understand what is the ethical and moral view with regard to love. And, but we have no desire to control anybody in how they live their lives. So mm -hmm. the practical day-to-day -day aspect, we, we don't have hardly anything to do with people on a day-to-day -day level in their personal lives. We spe spend a lot of time teaching the principles of love and what people do with that is up to themselves. We, we, don't, we don't tell them what they should do with it or how they should live their life. Yeah. And I suppose some other practical things, Rachel, are that we don't... We focus very much on a person um, changing in their heart mm -hmm. and being led by love from their heart. Yeah. And many other Christian faiths place down a set of rules that um, you should live by if you're good. Um, yeah. and, and sometimes people live by those rules but their heart isn't changed. And while we have specific ideas about what it means to live a good, loving life, we also um, educate people that if their heart doesn't change, then they're not really involved in, in living that life. So yeah. we have a really strong emphasis not on people, um, the facade that people place, but helping them to access what's really inside of them and also believing that they can heal those things. I think a lot of Christian faiths believe that we're all sinners, we're born sinners and we'll die sinners. Yeah. And 
uh, we believe very strongly that it's possible to overcome sin. It's not always easy uh, and it involves our heart and a lot of our pure intention, but that we can do those things. Yeah. And another really major difference is that we don't believe that Jesus, AJ, died for anyone's sins. Yeah. That's, that differentiates us from every Christian faith. What, what do you believe that you died for? or like? I died because people got angry with me and decided that the best way to deal with me was to kill me. <laughs> that oh, was yeah. the only reason why I died. Yeah. And uh, I would have preferred to have remained alive for a longer period of time. I would have gotten to enjoy my family, Mary, and my Mary was pregnant with my daughter, Sarah, Sarah yeah. and I, and so I missed out on uh, having a life on earth with Sarah. And I would have preferred to have been with both of them on earth rather than go to the spirit world when I did. So the only reason why I died was because of the anger and rage of the people around me and the misconception that most of them had about what the Messiah should be. Mm. They believed the Messiah should be somebody who came and fought the Romans and established a world government in Jerusalem. Yeah. And, uh, and the reality is that I never had any intention of doing that and never will have any intention of doing that. And so, you know, the, the reality was that their conception of my desires was completely different. Yeah. Uh, to what the, you know, I, I wanted something completely different to what they wanted. Yeah. Did you um after you passed? Did you ever sort of watch over Sarah and Mary and everything? Or? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I used to spend pretty much all my time uh, with my soulmate as much as I could, and and then also, um, I was my daughter's guide. So uh, as when you become a spirit. Sometimes you can be assigned to be somebody's guide or choose to take the role of somebody's guide. And I chose to take the role of my daughter's guide. So, so I was her guide for all of her life. Yeah. Did she um, ever sort of progress in this way of life or anything? On the earth? Um, yeah. yeah, she did. Uh, um, she lived with her mother and eventually she got married. She married another Bible character, Luke. Mm. And... Uh, and she, they eventually had children, but unfortunately all of the children and Luke were murdered and eventually Sarah was left alone and, uh, and she died of old age. Mm. Sad life. Mm. Um, so what are the beliefs, like the core beliefs of this faith? Is it just love, practically? Just love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love's the most important thing it can be. But let's uh, look at the two primary belief systems. First, the first one is that we need to love each other. Now, the way we love each other is by my only doing to you what I would like you to do to me, not what you actually do to me, but rather what I would like you to do. That, that is the underlying ethical principle of love. So we try to teach to every person that, uh, around us and also we live ourselves in a way that we try to treat others exactly like we would like to be treated by others. The second part of it though, which is probably even more important than that, so that's the basis of, of a loving interaction with people, but the second part of it is a, is a loving relationship with God. Mm. And what we teach there is that uh, if we are humble and open to God's truth, and we can actually long for God's love to enter our heart. And once we long for that and pray for that to occur, then God's love can enter us and transform us into a more loving person. And, and we need to allow ourselves to go through that process of change. Yeah. Um, how did you come to the realisation that you were Jesus? Like, was that difficult? And you as well as being Mary Magdalene. Like, when and how? Um... Well, for myself, uh, there were a lot of emotional experiences I've had since that I can remember from the age of two onwards um, that I didn't understand at all. And usually what I did when I ever had an emotional uh, feeling or memory of something that happened in the past, I would put it into the back burner and just get on with my life. But then I went through a process of change when I was around 40 years of age. Um, well, I went for the first change when I was 33 years of age. And, Did uh, you say four or forty? Forty. Okay. So for, I went for the first change when I was thirty-three years of age, 
I'd always had a belief this life that I would die when I was 33 to 35 years of age. And once that uh, didn't happen... Was that because um, in the first century or... Yeah, it's because, that... it's because of your memory of that death. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, but once that didn't happen, I sort of went through a, fair, a fairly emotional uh, time where I, where I had to work my way through quite a lot of emotions about just working out what I wanted to do with my life. And then when I was 40, I went through another huge emotional changes when, when I came to realise that all of my memories that I'd have had up till then and, and prior since then meant that I was Jesus. And, and I started remembering my life completely as a result of my acceptance of that. Was that, um, did they come in dreams at that point or was it just, how, no. how do they, how do the memories come? Are they just flashbacks or? Well, the Nothing best way like to that. explain it is if you, you remember if you, let's say you had an event when you were a child, like five or six years of age, where you got run over by a bus, right, let's say, <laughs> and you would remember the, probably remember the bus coming towards you. Mm. Uh, you'd probably feel some of the fear that you had with the bus coming towards you. And all of a sudden, if you got hit and you weren't hit too badly, uh, you, you might have still remained conscious. Um, and so if you remain conscious, this, you know, this, you may have had a you know, memory of being hurt and harmed and you might have had quite a lot of emotions about that. And then if you cast your mind back now on it, you probably remember those things occurring. Mm. For myself, it's very similar with one exception, and that is I don't have a mental picture of what happened. I only have an emotional picture of what happens. So, so I had emotional pictures of everything that's happened in my first century life, right from very, very young age when I, when I was you know, being brought up by my mum and, my mum and dad, Mary and Joseph, right the way through to my death and even after my death. <coughs> and uh, as I passed into the spirit world, what I did after in the spirit world, what I've done in the last 2,000 years in the spirit world. And every one of these has an emotional uh, response as well inside of me. So, you know, you have to go through something emotionally in order to have these particular memories. Mary could probably describe the process even better because she's actually going through it right now to a, to a larger yeah. degree. Than well, I, I often use the bus analogy because yeah. it's, it's sort of like when you have that memory of the thing that happened, especially if it was quite significant in your life, even if it was a fantastic birthday party, for example, mm. you often remember the smells and the, the feelings and the way everything looked and the emotions that were involved in that experience. And in particular, you... the emotions. Yeah. yeah. So you remember all the smells and stuff as well. Do you remember the picture or is that... No, well, what, well? It, what it's like for me is... Say I remembered the birthday party from this, from now, this life, I could remember the smells and the, the look of everything and the feelings I had of the party. Yeah. When I'm having a first century memory, it's like I have all of the feelings of the birthday party, for example, and I, I know that it happened just like if I remembered a birthday party from this life, but I don't have the smells or the, the picture of it, yeah. but the emotions Sometimes are... The smells. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but not the picture. Not the picture. Mm. But the the emotion is just as real as if it, if no. I was remembering it. Mm. Mm. Why do you suppose that is? Maybe because it's not the same body, so it can't remember. Well, all of your intellectual out. pictures are placed in the mind of your spirit body, and we don't have the same spirit body's mind that we had two thousand years ago. Mm. So, so all of the the mind-based pictures that we had have all gone. And we have a whole new set of mind-based pictures. However, the soul is the same soul, so we have all of the same feelings that we had all the way through our life for the last 2,000 years. Because the soul carries our emotions and our feelings and all those desires and things that we want for our life are all carried in the soul. But then we have a brain and a mind, a brain in our physical body and a mind in our spirit body. And those things, they, they're the things that keep the pictures. The soul okay. keeps the emotions. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. So we still have the same soul, but now we have a different body. So we don't have the pictures, but we have the feelings because that stayed with us. Yeah, where is the mind with the soul? Or is that because you know how you said you, yeah, okay. the mind's in the spirit body? Mm. And so the experiences of the physical body and the spirit body, they are 
filtered through the brain and the mind and we store them in our soul mm -hmm. and the same thing happens often when we remember something it comes to, from, the soul. from the soul back to us back to the mind what what is a spirit body spirit mm -hmm. body looks the same as your body looks now so right now your spirit body looks very very similar to your physical body that yeah. you have right now mm -hmm. it's a little larger just a few in your case just a few millimeters larger than 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 your spirit because you, uh, you can see a spirit body's body <laughs> around a person yeah. and and the soul is actually enveloping both bodies the soul is the real you and the bodies are just like the instruments that the yeah. real you uses to interface with the spirit world or the physical world yeah. okay um moving on to the next one yeah how did you sort of deal with um remembering all those things like did you have to sever, like, you know, being who you are, did you have to sever all your past connections or did your friends just sort of stop talking to you or are you still in contact with them? Or how, How's that going? How's your new life sort of sure. fitting in with your old life? Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, I guess it's been a little bit different for both of us, but I'll answer for me. When I met AJ, I had had a similar kind of experience in that there had been things happen in my life before I met him, big emotional experiences that I couldn't really understand, so I just sort of filed them mm, yeah. in the back and thought, oh, well, I don't know what that was about. I'll just keep going. Yeah. And then when I met him, I was having a fairly sort of mainstream life. I was interested in, in um, health and into world health and people, refugees and people in um, developing countries. In that? I'm still really yeah. interested in that, yeah. But I, my career was sort of in that in mm. that field. And when I met AJ, um, uh, I had a very strong emotional reaction to that as well. Mm. That was scary for me um, because these emotional experiences that I'd had only a few of before started to happen a lot. And so I was having these memories that we were just talking about, um, but it scared me and I didn't really understand it, even mm. though by this stage I sort of knew who he believed he was. I didn't really want to believe that or yeah. that I was anyone else. Um, so that was a pretty tough time for me, um, just yeah. very confusing and feeling like I had to let go. I felt like I had to let go of, of what I thought my life would be in the future because mm. I sort of had this idea of what it would be like and and really even part of me is still letting go of that feeling of mm. what I thought my life would be like. Do you sort of miss that plan? Yeah in the beginning I really missed that plan because yeah. I thought it would make me be accepted by everyone and I was I was very sad about this feeling that no one's going to accept me anymore. Yeah. Um, so in the, now I feel like I'll be much happier if I embrace God's plan for me, yeah. um, which is really a part of my soul's actual desires because God only wants us to have what in our true heart we really want, yeah. uh, in our true personality. And the, the feelings that I had about the old life or the one that I thought I was going to have were based around me avoiding the, some fears inside of me. And yeah. that's what made me have a dream this big instead of a dream this big. Because yeah. I thought I could do that and people would accept me while I did it. So in the beginning it was really sad for me to let go of that. And I didn't really have to let go of the people from the past. But I was very scared of them rejecting me. And so that made me pull back from them a lot. Mm. And for some of them they pulled back from me as well because they thought that it was all a bit weird and a bit strange yeah. and that I'd kind of lost the plot a Gone bit. Gone crazy. Gone crazy. Yeah. And that was especially hard with my family because they they not only thought that, they were pretty vocal with me about that and very mm -hmm. nasty towards AJ and that was that was a hard thing for me. Are you still in contact with all like your friends and family or I'm in contact with some friends that mm -hmm. I had in the past, I'm not in contact with my family anymore mm -hmm. because they um, they don't accept anything about the way that I live, and so mm -hmm. in order to be around them, I would have to accept those feelings from them. And yeah. I, I'd be happy to be in their life, having my life separate from as a different set of beliefs from theirs. But at the moment, every time I have contact with them, I feel like 
that are very um, hateful towards AJ and and very angry towards me for making a different choice. And so that's a decision that I've made to love myself more. Yeah. 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 So what about you? Can I just say I feel that you're not being entirely accurate about you were very angry when you first met me. I was very angry. And still in a lot of ways quite angry about the truth of who you are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'm happy to speak more about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was very scared when I first met AJ and I became very angry because I, I wasn't... Because of my fear, I didn't want to accept any of this stuff. So I wanted to reject him very strongly. Mm -hmm. And still, even now, being around him brings up feelings for me that I find really scary relating to um, feeling that I will lose him and that he will die and if I give my heart to him again, everything that happened in the past will happen again. Mm -hmm. So it's just coming from past experience in the first century. Yeah. 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 Okay. And so that whole... That whole, even that feeling is, was very confronting for me that I just met a guy and suddenly I felt like he was going to die and what? That's weird. And I had all of those kinds of feelings and, and I got really angry because I felt like I can't control. Remember how I had this plan? Yeah, the plan. This is where my life's going. Now all my, my feelings were out of control and I, I really wanted to control them and go mm. back to that plan. Yeah, so, so it's easier. That's what I thought. It yeah. would be easier because I wouldn't have to face any fear. Mm -hmm. And so for, for us, it's been quite challenging, um, especially for AJ, but it's been challenging for me as well. Uh, I just haven't been as humble about it perhaps as, um, as I could have been. But because being around him brings up so many memories um, and feelings, really, feelings that I've had all the time, but when I'm with him, they really come then um, I've done a lot of pushing of him away and then pulling him to come back and pushing yeah. and pulling. <laughs> yeah. So same question to do, uh, same question to you, like... Um, yeah, for me it was a little different to that. I, um, once I realised who I was, I told my mother first, actually, my sons first, and then... Mm. And they they weren't uh, concerned at all. So, <laughs> and 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 my my eldest son believes uh, that I am who I am. Um, my younger son is still un undecided, mm -hmm. but uh, but they, we still have contact all the time. So you know, there's no break in the relationship there. And then I told my, the next person I told was my mother. This was after quite a few months of emotionally working my way through different memories that I was having and, and trying to make heads and tails of them and things, things like that. Mm. And uh, once I told my mother, my mother got very upset and concerned for my welfare. So she went to a psychologist and the psychologist uh, asked her to report me to... Um, some institution and uh, and as a result I finished up having to get tested by the institution uh, with regard to my sanity and so forth and of course I, I went through all of that and uh, the most that I felt from that was just grief about my mother's actions in the end they didn't believe I was insane or anything but uh, but I was just very saddened by my mother's choice to do that she's quite saddened by it as well now yeah. um, and then um, after that, uh, I spent most of my time pretty much for the next few years alone, uh, where I processed my way through lots of different memories and emotions that I had. And, and um, during that time, I started meeting up with different people, you know, telling them about the truth, but it was very quiet. I didn't do much about it publicly. Mm. Until I got to the point where I realised that I probably just had to just be myself. Um, and I needed to begin to just be myself publicly as well as privately. So once I started doing that, um, and that was probably around five or so years ago now, uh, that's when things started to sort of ramp up in terms of different things. I lost, I had already lost most of my friends prior to that mm -hmm. uh, due to leaving a faith, a religious faith that I had. I used to be a Jehovah's Witness and and when I left that faith, I got condemned by that religion and, uh, and every friend that I had and every family member wouldn't speak to me. Um, 
And my parts of my family, my sister, for example, hasn't spoken to me now uh, for probably 15 or 16 years. Um, but my mum and dad still speak to me occasionally, um, and we occasionally see them. There's no animosity uh, there, but um, we have, of course, very different beliefs to what they have, So, um, and they find my, our beliefs very, very challenging, so, so they don't like to spend too much time in my company, otherwise they find themselves challenged quite a lot. So, yeah. But that being said, my mum and, and myself probably still communicate once every month or so. Mm -hmm. um, and my brother, I still talk to my brother, he's a younger brother than I, and, and I still talk with him. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, friends and things like that, um, well, I've, once, I, once I started realising who I was and, and remembering all of these things, it was very hard for me initially because, because nobody around me really accepted any of that. Nobody around me could believe it or accept it. Mm. And so in a lot of ways, um, I went through a very sort of alone period where I was just coming to terms with the fact of who I was, but also coming to terms with the fact that nobody would probably believe me yeah. <laughs> and things like that. So, and once I worked through those, a lot of those emotions, um, then I started to just do what I came here to do, which, which was basically to teach the divine truth to any person who would listen. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose that's one difference between me and AJ is that he had a lot of memories and he's really come to terms with the significance of those memories. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm still in that process of coming to terms with, I've had all these memories and I'm still in the process of coming to terms with the significance of what it means to have those memories and, and um, to honour the feeling of who I, who I feel I am uh, in, in the world and with everyone. That's something that I still um, am coming to terms with, just like he said he had Well, you're to sort of in rebellion with it at the moment, aren't you, to a degree? Like, you'd, you'd prefer to not be... You'd prefer to not have the memories, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. you? Really? Yeah, yes. Whereas and that's I, a... I went through a period where I'd prefer to not have the memories, but then I just resigned myself to the fact that I had them now and there's not much I could do about it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I also, at that point in time, I was quite um, well off financially. Um, I had, you know, quite a, quite a substantial... Uh, income and quite a, you know, I had quite a substantial amount of wealth, and so I just decided to live off of that mm -hmm. while I focused on, you know, just freely teaching these truths to other people. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, obviously, I spent all of that money doing that mm -hmm. uh, until I ran out of money completely, which happened about, you know, I think it was about four years ago or so, or nearly five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was a, I wanted to teach these principles, and I didn't have the same feeling as Mary in that I, that I was going to lose her through it because I had not met her yet. Mm -hmm. I felt that I was going to find her through it. Through does that make sense? Yeah. So, where, whereas uh, whereas Mary's uh, situation is very different. Uh, I I felt and I felt in the first century too that I'd find my soulmate once I embraced who I was and once I embraced teaching the truths that I felt were in my heart in my heart that were true and in the process of doing that I did find Mary in the first century and in the process of doing that in this life I did find her as well. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What would you say the ethical code is of this belief? You know like um, how there's the Ten Commandments like thou shalt not kill you know all those sort of things like what would you uh, yeah what would you say this um, this way of life. Well, I'd call the Ten Commandments uh, morality rather than ethics. And in fact, I find the Ten Commandments a false morality in many mm -hmm. cases rather than a pure ethics. Why is that? Well, the Ten Commandments, some of the commandments revolve around the treatment of women. And mm -hmm. It's not well known that some of the commandments are, uh, are quite denigrating mm -hmm. in, in some ways and they're certainly not ethical. If we look at the underlying principle of ethics, the ethics is... I would like to do, I want to do to you what I would like you to do to me. Yeah. So if we examine the principle of that carefully, we can see that I would not like you to punish me in any way. Mm -hmm. So I would never punish you. Does that make sense? Yeah. I would not like you to be angry with me. 
so I would never want to be angry with you. I would not like you to be uh, violent towards me, and so therefore I cannot be violent towards you. Yeah. So this is the true ethical principle of the golden rule that I taught in the first century, which was, you know, do unto others what you want them to do to you. Yeah. Now that is ethics. Um, the Ten Commandments are not strictly ethical because there are some parts of the commandments and if you look at the extension of the commandments in the book of Exodus, you will actually find some of the commandments are very, very negative and, and involve punishment and even death at the breaking of them. Now, mm -hmm. I would not like to cause your death for any reason, even, yeah. even if you did something that was wrong. I still wouldn't want to punish you and even if you became a murderer, I still wouldn't want to kill you yeah. because I wouldn't want to be killed myself. So this underlying feeling of ethics, uh, I feel, is something that people, and particularly Christians, don't understand completely. Because many times they treat other people how, how they definitely would not like to be treated themselves. Mm. So the principles we teach are very much based around this underlying principle of ethics, that the, the principle of the golden rule. And, mm. and we see, in fact, that many Christians are not practising this underlying principle. And instead, what they're doing is they're defining morality to the, be their own version of morality or to be what their interpretation of the Bible's version of morality is, rather than seeing it as an ethical thing of what would I like to have happened to me. Yeah. So in other words, they want to make a series of rules about what should happen rather than ask themselves the question, what do I want happening to me? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Mm. It's a lot about practicing love. The basis of everything that we teach is about practicing love and perfecting ourselves in love. So um, these ethics that AJ speaks about, uh, about the golden rule and doing to others what we would have them do to us, um, we, we're very much focused on the love in, in that principle and the love needing, as I said earlier, needing to come from our hearts in that principle rather mm -hmm. than it be an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. Because when we engage our intellect in that question, we can sort of let ourselves get away with a few things. When we really connect with our heart around that principle, then we start to look at everything that's happening in our lives, not just my interaction with you one-on-one, -on -one, but if I think about the way that I live in my house, the way that I interact with the environment, and how that impacts upon everyone around me in the world, and how I would like for them to treat their environment because it will impact on me and how I would treat the environment because it would impact on other people. And yeah. when we engage our heart in that question, it becomes a very life-changing question. And we even go deeper than that in the sense that we even examine the emotions that we have and whether we would like other people to have those emotions with us. So, mm -hmm. so for example, if I have an emotion of fear, what does that cause people around me to do? And a lot of times people feel then that they have to pander to my fear or they have to do what my fear dictates. Yeah. Now, I wouldn't like them to do that. I wouldn't like other people to do, to do that to me. So yeah. how can I do that to other people? So, yeah. so this causes us then to look at the emotion of fear and what do we need to do to let go of the fear so that we don't do that to other people. Mm. And if you think about, to give another example of giving gifts... If I think, well, I would love to have gifts given to me, I think it's loving to give gifts, so I'll just go around giving gifts all the time. Yeah. But if inside of my heart, as I'm giving the gift, there's a feeling of, oh, here, I have the gift, or a feeling of like, gee, aren't I good because I'm giving you a gift? Mm. All of those feelings are not really what I would like to receive from other people. And they're yeah. not ethical. Yeah. Yeah. So they're not ethical. So that's the part of ethics where we... We look at it very seriously from a heart perspective, not just from an actions perspective. Yeah. So, so what happens at Christmas time is often not, that, not ethical, you know, because <laughs> yeah. so, a lot of people go, oh, you know, they buy a gift for somebody else, and then when that person doesn't buy a gift for them, they get all upset. So yeah. that, that's not an ethical feeling. Like mm -hmm. when we buy a gift for somebody, it's a gift. It's, a, it's something that we shouldn't be requiring anything from them. And so, um, yeah, so these are, this is how, we take ethics right to, as many people have criticised us as doing, right to the nth degree. Yeah. 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 Um, so what do you think about teenage pregnancy and stem cell research and all those sort of issues like that? Like, what do you find to be unethical and all, yeah? 
Or how would we practice ethics in those yeah, in those yeah. situations? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the rather rather than try to answer every individual question, perhaps we can give a blanket answer yeah. which answers the question generally for most of these issues, mm. and that is that. Um, before we can make a choice or decision that's ethical, we must find out as much information as possible. In other words, we must discover as much truth as we possibly can before we can actually make uh, some kind of decision on, on a particular subject. So, for example, if we're looking at the issue of stem cell research, for example, we have to ask, we have to know the truth as to whether a growing embryo is actually a child. Mm. We have, and my belief is that it is, but we have to know the truth before we can actually make the ch choice or decision about what's ethical with that particular truth. In, re in regards to the teenage pregnancy that you mentioned, we must also understand the underlying causes that cause such a thing. So, so if, a, if a person who's a going to school gets pregnant, we need to understand why they've gotten pregnant. What, what are the underlying belief systems within the person, which obviously have come from the parents or the environment in some way, mm -hmm. that she's either in rebellion against or in support of, that mm -hmm. have caused the pregnancy to occur. And we need to understand all of the things associated with the underlying reason why the pregnancy has happened before we can answer the question about what do we think about the pregnancy. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah. So, for, so in each case, the pregnancy, the answer to the question may actually be different in the case of the pregnancy. Yeah. In some cases, it's fine if the teenager has gotten pregnant, if she's in a loving relationship with a loving guy who's willing to look after the child and are both able to support the child yeah. and so forth, then, then what's the problem that anybody has with it? Mm. Um, you know, but, but if she's not in a loving relationship and it's been because of different uh, events such as one night stands, one after the other, and her parents have, um, have not wanted to get any contraception because mm. they are Catholic and they believe in a certain, you know, principle yeah. with regard to contraception, and the reason for her pregnancy is then completely different uh, than for the first person. And, and we, rather than judging, uh, and we don't judge anything, well, rather than looking at a situation uh, as a person who's a teenage pregnancy has got a problem, we, the way we see it is that each individual situation is different in regard to the teenage pregnancy, for example, and therefore we need to understand the situation before we can really comment about it. Hmm. Something that we would feel about every situation, though, is that we would we never agree with judgment or anger towards anyone. Mm. Even if we feel that they are acting unethically or immorally, we, we never would um, have a feeling of judgment or hatred or anger towards that person because we believe that in practicing love with everyone. And as soon as we judge another person or we get angry with them, we're no longer practicing love. And also, whatever is... Um, in error in that situation, whatever is not loving in that situation will never be healed if we approach it with an attitude of judgment or hatred or anger. The only opportunity that that situation or that person or um, the conflict would have of healing would be if we were able to practice love with everyone. So that's where um, we would feel we would be ethical in approaching those situations is if we were able to love everyone involved in them. Yeah. Um, first, what, what sort of things in, I don't know how to word this, but someone who's following this sort of way of life, what's a sort of bad way to go? Like, what would, say, like, um, is there anything that you say, don't do this? Like, a judgment, anger, and those sort of things. Like, what, what are the sort of well, bad things? Yeah. But the problem with saying, don't do something, is that it causes a person to act without feeling. See, what we would prefer a person to do is that they feel why they're doing it. So, for example, if a person's judging another person, rather than say to them, don't judge the other person, we want to ask them the question, why are you judging the other person? Mm. What emotion inside of you causes you to think you should be able to judge the other person? Yeah. And rather than, you know, condemning somebody for whatever action they have taken, let's say they've gotten pregnant and they're a teenager, Instead of, saying, instead of saying, you naughty girl, you've gotten pregnant, why did you do that? 
we, we want to ask, what caused, what emotions within you caused you to feel that you wanted to get pregnant or that caused you to resist having any form of contraception or that caused you to have a lot of different partners? What was the underlying emotion that caused you to do this? You see, if you're focused on the cause of the issue and you love the person, then, then you want to help them solve the cause. Yeah. If, you, if you're just focused on telling them, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, then they're going to go around going, oh, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't do that, without thinking about what's causing them to do it. And yeah. it's the cause that's the most important thing yeah. to find out. So you could probably say we never say anything, you shouldn't do it or you should do this thing. We, we're actually opposed to that kind of thing, as AJ pointed out. Yeah. But we do try to promote certain things. We do, we do uphold certain principles or, or talk to people about things which we feel would help them live a life that would make them happy and help them to be loving to other people. And there are a lot of the things that we already have spoken about, about love and understanding what love is and how to have a relationship with God and how that helps you love in a better way and how when you are angry or hateful or in judgment then there's something to look at inside of yourself uh, so we never say you can't do it in fact we say if that thing's inside of you you need to look at that yeah. you can't suppress it or deny it you have to look at it mm -hmm. so that you can heal it okay. in fact we feel one of the big problems with religion on the planet is they make a whole list of rules that pretty much a lot of the people who are part of the religion have no idea of how to actually achieve. Yeah. And then they all feel guilty that they're not doing it. And, and beat themselves and up. And then beat themselves up. Try hard. And then tell themselves that they're sinners and all these other things. <laughs> when the reality is, if we are willing to look at the cause of why we do things, we can change it. We can actually change the cause within us and then not do it ever again. And that's really what we try to promote. So, so you don't... Um you know, give out any consequences or anything like that. No, no we love everyone. Yeah. Just the same and everyone. Yeah, we do say to people, though, what happens to their soul if they make choices that are unloving. So every time, so, so we tell people about the truth about what happens to your soul. So whenever we make an unloving choice, our soul degrades in its condition and gets darker. And therefore, we, we attract harder things in our life and certain and dark things happen in our life. If we grow in love in our soul, our soul gets brighter or lighter and we attract brighter events. And if we pass in a dark condition, then we'll pass into what people have called the hells of the spirit world. Mm -hmm. But we have the ability to get out of that condition. So what we do is we say to people the truth about what happens when you choose to do things that are unloving, what happens to do when you do choose to do things that are loving, and also we tell them that even if they've chosen to do things that are unloving in the past, they can yeah. change those things in the future. Yeah. yeah. We, we believe that God never punishes anyone. God does provide consequences, as AJ spoke about, where when we make an unloving choice, it affects our soul condition and that affects where we are able to visit in the spirit world or able to live in the spirit world. So, but we don't see that as a punishment, more as God trying to show us and teach us love in everything. And we believe that God is trying to show and teach all of us love every day in our lives as well. Yeah. So because we don't believe that God would ever punish anyone, we would never think of punishing anyone ourselves. Yeah. So, people, only... so people can listen to us for a while if they want and then go away. Some of them have been angry with us and then they come back and then, mm. you know, then they go away again because they're angry about something else that we've said or done that they don't mm. like or whatever. And, and the reality is we just let people come and go as they please. Uh, we don't control them and also we don't dislike them and prevent them from coming back to the, the teachings at any time in the future. The only, the only way we probably provide a consequence is if someone is in our personal life um, or in our, the organisation that we've set up called God's Way of Love and they are repeatedly unloving towards ourselves or anyone else in mm. the environment, then we would say, just like I've done with my parents, as I spoke about earlier with my family, saying, I can't be in your company until, until you decide to change in terms of love. Mm. Because to do that would just be not loving me. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be the only time that we would... And I don't feel that that's about withdrawing love, but that's just about withdrawing myself so that I can stay in a state of love with myself. Yeah. So we want to promote love, and the only way you can promote love is by showing or talking to people when they're being, about, when they're being unloving, and if they continue to be unloving, then there has to be some kind of consequence to it, in the sense that, that we just don't want to spend time with them. Yeah. And that's and that's a personal choice and decision. Is that is that something um, that your followers um, have to do? Like, if you say you're being unloving, then they all have to shut them out. Like in um, in no. Jehovah's Witness, you know how no. one person leaves and then the rest of them. No, no, no. it's up to yeah. each individual and whether what they do. But in the organisation we've made, which is for which is a, like a public uh, organisation for. Um, practicing love in that organization we say to them look you're not willing we're, we're willing to have you back but you have the you know deal with this issue of a lack of love so if the work person is angry or yelling at somebody or they're angry in a meeting with somebody then we just say well you go home and do deal with that and when you dealt with all of that come back yeah. But if you come back without dealing with it, then we'll ask you to go away again. <laughs> yeah. And often when people are excommunicated like that in faith that we, you mentioned, there's a lot of feeling from everyone involved that they're bad and they're wrong and, you know, we have to shut them out. Yeah. Uh, and we definitely don't have those kinds of feelings towards people. No. When, even when we say, look, I can't be around you at the moment, uh, we always still have this feeling of respect for them and a feeling mm -hmm. of of care for them as a person. And the reason why we do that is we, we see love of self as exactly the same as love for another. So in other words, my love for you needs to be as great, but not greater, than my love for me. Yeah. And my love for me needs to be as great, but not greater, than my love for you. And what so I would treat you and myself exactly the same way. Yeah, what about um, people's love for God? Mm -hmm. Is that supposed to be on a sort of, you know, more important thing or is it... When you say supposed to be, from God's perspective, God gives us free will to make any choice or decision we want. Yeah. So from God's perspective, um, a person on earth can't say, you've got to have a relationship with God and if you're not, you're a bad person. The reality is, is God is offering a relationship with every single one of her children and whether her children take that relationship or not is really up to them. Yeah. Now, if we told everybody around us that they have to have a relationship with God, otherwise we won't have anything to do with them, then we would be very hypocritical because God does not even do that with them. Yeah. So what we do instead is we encourage them to have a relationship with God because there are many benefits from having a relationship with God. Yeah. But, but if somebody chooses to not have a relationship with God, we don't say, oh, well, you're not in our life then either. Yeah. But AJ and I both personally believe that if, you ha that if we have a strong relationship with God and if we put that first in our lives personally, mm -hmm. then we'll be able to love everyone else and our environment in a much better way if we put that relationship with God first in our lives. And we'll demonstrate to others how yeah. to love. Like, and that's the part of what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is show by example how to love like how to love God, how to love others, but also how to love the environment, how to love mm. children, how to love animals, you know, how to love everything that's around us. Yeah. Is is love for a soulmate? Is that um, different from from that from love to God or love to everyone else, or is it sort of everyone's equal in the amount of love? Or yeah, well, um, yes, yeah, very different actually, because you, the difference between your soul, soulmate and every other person is the soulmate is the other half of you. Mm -hmm. So, so um, it's very different in in its nature, in the sense that because your soulmate is the other half of you, you will obviously feel far more bound to the other half of you than you will feel bound to anybody else in the universe. Mm -hmm. However, in terms of the ethical treatment of your soulmate. Yeah. That needs to be the same as your ethical treatment of anyone else, as, long, as well as the ethical treatment of yourself. Yeah. So in other words, um, it, you wouldn't let your soulmate get away with something, uh, or, you know, in terms of when I say get away with something, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't, so let's say your soulmate lied, 
And under normal circumstances, you would talk to a person who lied and say, look, you lied, and, and what, you know, have you looked at the cause? If your soulmate lies, you wouldn't go, oh, she's my soulmate, so I won't talk to her about that because I'm afraid of yeah. losing the relationship. You'll go, no, actually, you lied, and there's an Instagram, you know, you'd say the same thing. Yeah. And that's what ethics would demand. Hmm. So, so while there will at some point be a very, very strong bond between the two halves of the soul, and that love will be very unique in its nature, and it's also the only love that's sexual in its nature, and, and so therefore it's very, very different. The reality still is the love of God, and then there's the love of us, which is including the other half of myself, mm. and then there's the love that we have for everyone else, and they are generally the principles of, you know, what are the binding forces of love. In other words, the greatest love is our love of God, which the two halves of the soul collectively can have, and then there's the love that we have for each other, which is the next strongest binding force, and then there's the love that we have for all of God's children, which yeah. are the ne- which is the next strong yeah. binding force. Um, so you said that um, the soul. Can I just point one thing yeah. out there? Yeah. The one love does not though uh, sacrifice itself for the other. In other words, I won't sacrifice my love for my soulmate and hurt you mm. if she wanted me to hurt you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, if I am ethical in my perspective. I would see that love never sacrifices itself for 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 something to do something that's out of harmony with love. Yeah. 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 Um. Yeah. So you said that um, the sexuality between soulmates. Do you um, believe that it's unethical or wrong to be sexual with people who are other than your soulmate? Like for people who are in, you know married or something who aren't with their soulmate. Well, firstly, um, it's up to the individual what they do with their own ethics. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so I don't have the right to tell you what you should do with, se- with sexuality, for example. Yeah. That's really up to you, and that's between you and God, because it's a personal thing. The only time that it affects me is if you wanted to have sex with me, and I'd just say no, because <laughs> I don't want sex with you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's the only time when, when I would you know, say you know, that I can interfere is when when it involves me in some way. However, we need to ask ourselves the question about what did God design as well. And we believe strongly that God designed the sexual union to be a part of the soulmate union. And and in fact, the sexual union will be the best if it's with your soulmate and no one else. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and for that reason, we promote people... Uh, getting into a condition of love where they can find out who their soulmate is, but but we do not uh, promote people being unloving towards a partner that they're currently with. Mm. So so there is a ethical balance that needs to occur um, there. What we find is that if people follow their desires and passions, and they connect to God and they connect to themselves emotionally eventually they'll find out who their soulmate is. Now, sometimes they'll be married to their soulmate already or whatever, and that's great. But if if they're not, then the relationship will naturally break up anyway because sooner or later, only what God has created will be be what we do. And so um, sooner or later, so we do not condemn people when they break their marriage, for example. We don't uh, tell people that they have to remain married forever. The fact is, in the first century, I told people that they would never remain married forever. And I told people that uh, once a person passes in the spirit world, the marriage bond is dissolved anyway. And so um, they couldn't remain married forever. And uh, and the reality is that many people who are currently married on earth will not remain married forever. I think the record's got your words a bit twisted as the years went on. Of course, yes. Yeah. And, and, and this is part of the problem, is that, is that uh, if people examine... Uh, the Bible often... The Bible has many flaws. One of the primary flaws that it has is that, is that it teaches a punishing, wrathful, and loving God. Mm. That is, and we've just done an interview with a university student about that today. And this is a very primary flaw that exists in the Bible because if you believe in an unjust and unloving and punishing God, then you'll start wondering under what circumstances God is unjust and unloving and punishing and then you'll want to be the same yourself. 
and, mm. and unfortunately that causes many people on the planet to be unjust and unloving and punishing and violent as well. So we don't see that about God's nature at all. And this is the primary flaw in the Bible. The Bible promotes a God like that, and yeah. we certainly cannot promote a God like that. The God we know is very different, always loving, never punishing, never wrathful, never angry, yeah. and never violent. Yeah. If I could just add to the soulmate issue, if you, you can look at um, the issue of sexuality in terms of ethics, which is like the golden rule, mm. and I believe that would lead you to fidelity. That would lead you to be faithful to one partner because essentially I believe that everyone, when they come into harmony with love, only wants to share that love with one other person and would only want their partner to share it with them also with one other person. Yeah. Also. Mm. When we connect to God more, I believe then there becomes a moral choice around sexuality because the truth is that God did create us with a soulmate and because he created us that way, as AJ pointed out, I believe that he created us only to share our sexuality um, with that other person, and that would be a moral state to be in. Mm -hmm. Now, for most people, it's very hard for them to identify who their soulmate is mm -hmm. because they have many injuries to their, to their unique personality because the soul shares the same unique personality but because we're all born to different parents who have their own um, their own personalities and demands and expectations of what their child should be like and when we're little we want their love so much that we do a lot of things to try and get it yeah. that can often alter how we express our true nature and personality mm. so yeah. for most of us by the time we get to be an adult it's hard to recognize who is my soulmate yeah. But if I believe that if we practice ethics, then we will, we will form, we will have sexual interactions that are quite um, faithful, faithful, mm -hmm. and respectful. Mm -hmm. And if we develop a relationship with God, in the end, we will be in a position to make a moral choice because we will know who our soulmate is. Yeah. Um, we never, we never um, tell people that they must know who their soulmate is because we understand that. In this process, what we're encouraging people to do is to discover themselves more fully. Mm -hmm. And as they, until they do that to quite a large extent, it, it's going to be very hard for them to recognise who their soulmate is. Yeah. So until that point, we promote love, ethics and respect between couples. Yeah. And many times we find that people use this soulmate teaching as a justification for badness. And what I mean by that is that they go, they go, oh, I think that person's my soulmate. So they enter a sexual relationship with them. Oh, okay. And then they go, oh, no, that person's not my soulmate anymore. That person is. So they enter a relationship with them. Yeah. And then they go, oh, that person's not my soulmate either. That person is. And then they enter a relationship with them. Yeah. The, the reality also, also is... Also stealing husbands if they think... All sorts of things yeah, happen. Yeah. yeah, all sorts of things happen as a result of that. Now, we don't, we don't agree with any of those things. Mm -hmm. Because a person who's truly wanting open to their soulmate will actually probably not enter into any relationship at all until they meet their soulmate. Yeah. And because once the soulmate part of yourself opens, you automatically recognise who isn't your soulmate, and so therefore you cannot interact with them sexually. And, and in fact, it's impossible to even sexually be sexually aroused with a person unless they're your soulmate, once you open that part of your soul. That being the case... If everybody did, chose to do that, there'd be nobody who ever got married to anybody other than their soulmate. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but unfortunately, many people distort our teachings for their own personal gain. So, so they, they hear the thing of soulmate and then they go, oh, all I've got to do is call such and such my soulmate and then I'm allowed to have a sexual relationship with them. And, mm. and the reality is that's not what we're promoting. We're promoting ethics even in the family and even with our partner. And we're not promoting a person going from one person to the other person trying to discover who their soulmate is. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just curious, is everything that you're teaching now exactly the same as how it was in the first century or over the past 2,000 years have you changed your perspectives on a couple of things? Or yeah. Well, essentially, the principles of love and the relationship with God are exactly the same. Yeah. And the soulmate issue is exactly the same as what we taught in the first century. Mm -hmm. There are many principles that we taught in the first century that are exactly the same. 
There's a few things that I'm teaching now that are extensions of that because obviously over 2,000 years of life, you learn mm. a lot more things. Yeah. And there are many things that I've yet to teach that, uh, that I haven't even begun to teach yet that uh, it will extend these truths even further. But, uh, but, you know, when I was in the first century, I was in a, in a condition of abundance with God and because I was in that condition, I could, I could feel what God felt and so therefore I could feel what God felt on all sorts of subjects and therefore teach about those particular subjects. Yeah. So our teachings are very, very similar to the teachings we gave in the first century but an extension of them and we expect as we remember more, there will be more extensions of those, of those teachings. Yeah. We don't expect anybody to follow them. It's really up to the individual as to what they do, whether they follow them or not. And we also have no power over individuals. And so we don't, you know, expect to, we don't control anybody or manipulate their will in any way. Mm. Some people think that uh, by me claiming to be Jesus, I'm automatically manipulating people's will. But actually, the actual results are that when I claim to be Jesus, most people become very highly suspicious and they become more untrusting than if I hadn't claimed to be Jesus. So, yeah. so the reality is that it makes less people listen when I claim to be Jesus than more people listen. So there's less respect. I usually get less respect from people when I claim to be Jesus mm. than, than I get if I just claim to be, you know, the person who have been the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you, like, okay, before when you mentioned growing in love, your soul lightens and, um, you know, getting more hateful of everything, um, it darkens. How do you suggest um, growing in love? Like, what do you teach as the best way to grow in love? Well, there's basically three principles, three basic principles. Firstly, we have to be humble, and that means that we have to be able to feel everything within ourselves and be prepared to change our feelings about things. Mm. We need to, and the only way we can change feelings is by releasing the old feeling through, through an emotional process and absorbing a new feeling, often through another emotional process. Mm. Right? And then the second thing is that the, when we're humble like that, we're open to truth. So we're open to hearing new truth, discovering new truth, seeing new truth, and it doesn't matter where it's from. It could be from a child, or it could be from an old person, or it could be from somebody who's a scientist, or it could be from yeah. somebody who's not you know, educated at all, and we're open to receiving new truth from everywhere in our environment. Yeah. But the third and most important thing is that, is that we can have a personal relationship with God by longing for God's love to enter us. And what we encourage people to do is for, to actually have a feeling of longing for God's love to mm -hmm. enter them and to establish this personal relationship with God. So that are the three primary things that are needed for a person to grow and change emotionally. Mm -hmm. Now, a person can grow and change emotionally without God, but it's very, very much more difficult because who do you, who do you find the truth out from? Mm -hmm. it, it might be from another person on earth, but... If the other person on earth is in the same place as you are, then how are you ever going to discover the truth? Mm. It's far better if we can connect to God and then discover the truth because we've connected to a person who knows the truth. Yeah. Um, so when you said you you um, change your emotions, like um, heal them by having an emotional thing, is that emotional thing crying? It's not always crying, no. Like if the, if the emotion that, that we're experiencing or that we feel inside of us is anger, then we're going to have to go and feel angry. We're yeah. going to have to go and bash a baseball bat or, or something, you know, with a punching bag or something, something yeah. that does it in a loving way to release the anger. And then if we feel shame, then we might be feeling, we might, might not be crying, we might be just going, feeling, you know, like terrible and ashamed and yucky inside if we feel fear, then we might be trembling or, or screaming even if we're terrified that much. Um, and, and then if we're sad, then we'll be grieving. So it just depends on what emotion as to what we'll need to do to experience it. Yeah. Now, a child doesn't ask that question though. A child, a little child, when it's afraid, it just trembles. When it's crying, it just cries. When it's ashamed, it goes, you know, it goes yeah. a little shy. When, it, when it's uh, angry, it yells, you know. 
And really that's what we must do. We must become like a little child in the way that we express emotion or experience emotion. But we need to do it in a loving manner, in not damaging anybody else. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so do you encourage any charity works or anything, like um, donating um, a lot of your wealth or anything to charity? Is it... Or well, do you as people we, do it as well? Or? Well, we believe that everything... Um, we believe in gifting mm, as, yeah. a, as a core principle. So everything that AJ and I do is as a gift. And um, sometimes people want to donate to us for giving that gift, but we never expect anyone to give us anything for what we do. So yeah. we believe that these teachings are pretty life-changing and could be world-changing, and we both feel really strongly that we would like to give them as a gift to people. Yeah. Um, we have also in the last year or so set up an organisation called God's Way of Love and the purpose of that organisation is to help people to understand what it means to really live in humility and long for truth and long for God. And, and through, to live giving the gift of your love. Like, yes, yeah. and to live giving the gift of your love and also gifting to other areas of the community who maybe don't share these beliefs yeah. um, and gifting to each other and what that actually looks like. So There just... is one area that we don't agree with charity, though. Yeah, which is? Uh, well, possibly two areas, actually, now that I think about it. One, one area is that we don't agree with charity that doesn't change the cause of the problem. So in other words, uh, it's no good throwing some money or resources at something that's not the actual cause of the problem that's being created. Like um, homelessness and giving the money to build shelters? or um, No, well, you know, obviously the cause of homelessness is that they yeah. don't have shelter. Yeah. But, uh, so you could say that is one part of the cause, but it's not the whole cause because mm -hmm. the whole cause is a lot more involved than that. No, let's, if I could I'll give you an example with a very simple e example. Mm. Um, an example would be, let's say somebody decided to lie. Right? Yeah. Now, we don't believe that talking to somebody about lying is the solution to the problem. Because mm. the solution to the problem is trying to find out why they lied. Yeah, Does that make yeah. Sense? yeah, going back to the yeah, other Going back to the real cause. Now, if we look at a lot of the world problems, particularly a lot of charities, they throw money uh, at uh, not the cause, but the effect of the problem. So, for example, refugee centres are an effect of a bigger problem. And it's that they mm. are caused by nations rejecting those refugees. Mm. So the reality is, if any nation actually accepted these refugees, then there'd be no refugees. Mm. They'd all be people who had a home to live in and a place to live. But they've, they've got these refugee centres that have been created because no nation is willing to accept them all. Mm. No nation wants them. Yeah. And this is the cause of the problem. So we feel we need to focus our effort and time and money on the cause of problems, not the effects. How would you um, focus... Like, um, how would you sort of help the cause of getting nations to open up the borders? Or well, this is you... where we feel like rather than focusing on trying to fix the problem for the refugee initially, what we needed to do is do that as well. But what we need to do also is begin an education system in the country that we're living in saying, do you realise that if we opened our borders and accepted these people into our country, then there would be no refugees. Mm, yeah. you know, do you realise that it would be a great benefit to our economy and there will be great benefits in a lot of different areas if we did this? You know, many of us don't do it because we're afraid of them. That's why mm. we don't do it. And do you realise how your fear is affecting everything? So we would prefer to educate and spend money and time and everything educating people to change those particular emotions so that they eventually... If receive these refugees with an open heart mm. and then there'd be no problem of refugees on the planet. Yeah. So, so the issue we see is that in every single thing that we face on the planet, there is a cause of the problem and then there are the effects of the problem. Yeah. We do not believe in charity towards the effects of the problem unless the charity is also going towards the cause of the yeah. problem. So what, what charities do you believe are going through the causes? Um, 
uh, very few charities are going through the causes of problems at, mm. at, at present. There are possibly yes. some that are, that are addressing the causes. And uh, when we're asked to give to those charities or when we desire to give to those charities, we will. But there are very, like for example, a cancer charity is not addressing the cause of the problem. What, what do you mean by that? Well, the charity that, that gives money to cancer patients <clears throat> and pays for cancer patients' treatment without addressing the reason why the person got cancer, which is an emotional cause, oh, okay. then it is pointless because the person, people will still keep getting cancer. If you address the emotional reason why people get cancer, we'd be willing to support that particular cause. Does yeah. that make sense? What if it was um, giving money to help them find the cure? Is that, is that sort of... No, the cure, if they're looking for a cure from a medical perspective... Yeah, the medical cure. ...then they're not going to find the cause because the cause is not, is not oh, a medical okay. problem, it's an emotional problem. Yeah. It's a very similar to the cause of depressive, depressive illnesses, uh, manic depression, schizophrenia, a lot of these different illnesses are actually not caused by anything to do with a medical problem. They're caused by emotional issues within the person yeah. that can be addressed. Now, if the research was going towards addressing the emotional cause, we'd be very happy to support such a research. Mm -hmm. But if the research is going only towards an effect or creating a, a, another industry, for example, creating a pharmaceutical industry to mm. fix the cause that could be fixed using something else, then we can't agree with those those particular charities. Yeah, mm. that's fair enough. Um, do you? How do you get income to teach the um, this way of life? Well, similar to what I just said, um, yeah. only through people donating um, to us. In the we past, don't ask for donations. Yeah. Uh, we just have a little box up the back of anything that we do, and if people want to donate, they can put it in the box. If they don't, they don't. Okay. So AJ, before I met AJ and before he really remembered who he was, he had quite a bit of wealth. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the early stages of him teaching, he relied on that wealth and nobody donated to him. Mm -hmm. And then in the past few years, um, in the past four years, AJ ran out of personal money and I didn't have very much when I met him. Yeah. And so um, we ran out of that quickly and now we just rely on donations from people. But we also feel um, it's okay if people don't donate to us, then we just don't go somewhere and oh, don't okay. teach. You know, we don't say, uh, we don't hold it over people as a kind of punishment that unless you pay something we won't come yeah, yeah. but we do say to people like for example a lot of people overseas now are starting to invite us and we say look we'd be interested in coming but we just don't have the money at the moment if we receive the money from somewhere else or if you guys want to donate then we'll come for sure yeah. because we're yeah. very passionate about teaching yeah. yeah so a lot of the money that comes by um, donations is put towards trips, um, worldwide trips to sort of educate people from other nations. Yeah, not uh, just overseas, but not here, just in overseas, Australia. here in Australia as well. Yeah. So it depends too on on where we get the donations from, because we see sometimes donation as a part of desire. So you know there are some very wealthy countries that have wanted us to come. Um, Countries, as in people wanting to come, people have where a people standard. have a high standard of living and a high degree of wealth, yeah. and yet they do not want to donate anything towards us coming. Yeah. And so we sort of see that, oh, oh the desire must be very strong for us to go there. And mm -hmm. if we receive money from some other source to go somewhere, we probably wouldn't visit that particular country. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because we don't feel the desire for us to be there is very strong. Other times we've had a desire that's very, very strong to go to a certain place, like recently with our Brazil trip, where people there don't have a lot of money. And, um, and all of the money came from just a couple of people who decided to give us the money to go to that location. Yeah. And the reality is that we financially live uh, with, with uh, very little in our bank account on a week-to-week -week basis. So. Mm. I think at the moment we've got about $600 in our bank account, um, which is uh, often the case because any money that we receive we usually give away or spend 
on you know traveling somewhere or mm. giving something away or something like that so yeah. so you so, live life in the moment yeah we live life in the moment and we just rely on on the fact that you know when you speak the truth and you and you act in harmony love and you live a life of abundance then it's pretty unusual that some that some money doesn't come along in time for you to pay a certain bill or not yeah and we have very little expenses now we i bought this property that we live in uh, with my own money before i began to te- be- began teaching and before i was receiving donations and it's and this is a little two bedroom house on 40 acres and we're happy to live here and we don't need anything more and the only other expense that we actually have besides food or our own clothes and electricity you know the basic things like that is one vehicle that we have all of our sound equipment in and we pay that regularly every month mm-hmm. and they are the only regular payments that we have so the reality is we can live quite cheaply as well mm-hmm. in comparison to most people yeah. we, we've spent some money recently on um some earthworks around our property and getting some things because we want to be able to demonstrate ways to regenerate the earth and so yeah. we're using this property as kind of an example like uh, an experiment, an experiment yeah. that hopefully yeah. works um uh, as a way to show how we can give things back to the land you know, and some of... people have donated as funds just to do that mm-hmm. so so when a person donates as funds just to do something then we use those funds to do that particular thing Mm-hmm. So, you know, when somebody donated funds for us to go to Brazil, we went to Brazil, you know. Yeah, yeah. We didn't go and use that money elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, how do you put the word out there about this sort of group? Like, I know you give out, you don't, like, um, you give out DVDs and stuff just for free. And Is there any other way or is it just word of mouth? Uh, very much word of mouth. Rachel, we don't believe in um, marketing ourselves at all, so so we don't actually publicise anything we do apart from on um, our websites, mm-hmm. and we don't um, we don't believe in putting something in someone's face like an ad on TV or something like yeah. that. We we believe strongly that people are led by their desire in life, and when they have a desire for truth or a desire to explore new things, the law of attraction brings them things and very many people describe that experience with us that they they have just oh someone they hardly knew gave them a dvd and they thought wow this is the best thing or yeah or somebody um shared a link with them because we have a youtube channel mm. uh, where all of the talks that aj has given are there for free for people mm. to watch mm. uh someone's just sent someone a friend a link and they've they've found it really great but we yeah. don't we don't feel like we want to um make people listen to us or um, put ourselves in, in their face. We, but we, we also don't believe in hiding ourselves either, which is why we're very open and anyone who wants to come and talk to us, we'll, we'll talk to. And if you want to use this information any way you want, that's okay with us as well. Mm. So, okay. Yeah. And also with regard to distributing the words, or I suppose you could say, or what we're teaching, the YouTube channel, which is called the Divine Truth Channel, Divine the Divine Truth Channel, um, is a, it's got seven hundred hours of our talks and discussions that we've done with people mm-hmm. in different seminars. So there's a lot of information there about all sorts of subjects. And then our website, which is called www.divinetruth.com, that website is like a link to all of that information. You know, there's all the, yeah. there's printed information, PDF documents. Uh, sound files there's I think there's another 700 hours of sound files on that site and we do all of that for free so all of that is provided for free anybody can get onto it and download anything they want from it we don't have any copyright on anything we do either so we don't we don't you know force a person to honor you know the source of the information or anything like that we just believe that if if we're here to distribute the truth in a loving manner, then we're just going to distribute it worldwide as best we're able with our resources that we have at, at our disposal and, and uh, do it in an ethical manner. So, and that's why we don't market, so we don't push it on people. Yeah. Uh, we wait for people to express a desire and then we give them the information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I think that's most of my questions answered. Thank you for um, talking to me about this and everything. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. It's nice to talk to you. And good, good mm. luck with your school projects that you've got going on with it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.